thinking the Christian topic, the doctrine of salvation. Now this is a big topic and I wanna start off by saying, don't throw tomatoes at me if you disagree with what I have to say this morning. What we do here at Mission Gathering is we're an amazing community that has a variety of different views and perspectives. And we together, centered on Jesus, allow for this wide array of diversity. And so I'm gonna give you one perspective on the topic of salvation this morning, one that you might not have heard in church before, and you don't have to agree with it. Um, and tonight I wanna to invite you all to come on out to our screening of the movie Hellbound where we are going to explore these topics a little bit more in depth tonight. And if you have questions, comments, concerns, that's where we can have some time to wrestle through all of this. So I wanna start off this morning by saying, y'all need to get saved. <laughs> How many of you heard that language before in church? Yeah? Depending on how you came to the Christian faith, you've probably heard that language of being saved, getting saved, and salvation in many different contexts. Whether from street preachers on the side of the road handing out gospel tracts with signs demanding that you repent or you're going to perish, or in a Pentecostal context where you sing praises to God for salvation, no word is perhaps more central to Christian theology than salvation. So in the midst of this series called Rethink, I think it's really important for us to take some time and step back and ask what does it mean when the Bible uses this word saved? In today's message, I wanna explore three primary questions. First, I want to ask what is salvation biblically? Second, I'm gonna ask who is saved? And lastly, I wanna ask what is the end goal, the culmination of this thing called salvation? Where is it all going in the end? These are three massive questions and books upon books upon books have been written about them. And I'm gonna fly by past a ton of this information this morning. So again, I really encourage you to come out tonight. This documentary Hellbound is an hour and a half long of exploring this in a very compelling way. And we can dig a little bit deeper this evening. Sound good? Good. So let's dive into question one. What is salvation? There are two words used in the Bible that are translated salvation. The words soteria and sozo. The first word, soteria, is a noun. And it literally means to prosper, to be preserved, or to be set free. And the second word, sozo, is a verb that can be translated to be safe from judgment or negative consequences. So from the very start, I want to acknowledge that these definitions, which are based on actual Greek words that are used in scripture, are significantly different than many of the conceptions that we have already had about salvation in the church. When you look at the actual definition of the word and what the theological concepts that we've embraced about salvation, we begin to see that there's already difference right at the start. Soteria is by far the most common word used in scripture for salvation. And like I said, it's this noun that describes a state of being, a state in which, one of, in which we can prosper and be liberated. The first portion of this sermon, I want to look at the book of Romans, because if you know anything about the Bible, the book of Romans is kind of the book where salvation is talked about in depth and the most. And so we're gonna start with Paul's words in Romans um, and we're gonna look at the 13 times throughout the book of Romans that Paul talks about either sozo or soteria. Soteria is used in scripture in famous Bible verses that many of you, if you grew up in church, probably have heard. Verses like Romans 1, 6, which says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. And then in Romans 13, 11, it says, the time is here for us to wake up from our sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In this context, understanding the literal definition of the word soteria, which is to prosper or be liberated, we can see that Paul is talking about salvation here, and he's talking about what happens when we conform our lives to the way of Jesus, when we walk according to his gospel. Paul tells us that we will experience the power of God 
for liberation and prosperity, which he calls salvation in this life. Paul also writes to the church at Rome and says that as they grow in their faith and in their conformity to the way of Jesus, that their prosperity and their liberation in this life grows nearer. In other words, when we look at the word soteria, we see that Paul is talking about a quality and a type of life that we can experience right now. Paul says it's growing nearer. He says that when we believe and conform our lives to the gospel, we'll experience a prosperous life and a life of liberation. In this context, salvation isn't something far off. We're clearly not talking about some ultimate salvation when Paul's speaking here in a place called heaven or in a place called hell. No, there's no indication in these words that that's what Paul is talking about when he says soteria at all. Instead, it's about experiencing prosperity and liberation in this life, in this world, here and now. Amen? So the second word, sozo, which is a verb, It's an action of of being protected from negative consequences. And we see this word sozo used in verses like Romans 10, verse 9, which says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And then in Romans 10, verse 13, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, looking at this verb in these contexts, it could be argued that Paul is teaching what is the traditional Christian understanding of salvation, to be saved from the judgment of God, or the wrath of God, or salvation from this place called hell. This is where such theology emerges. But again, when we look at the isolated uh, uses of this word sozo, we see that in these verses there's no natural indication of anything like hell. But instead, Paul's talking about the natural consequences of sin and the chastisement of God to correct us when we do wrong. In both of these verses, we see the correlation between calling on the name of Jesus and being rescued from the sense of judgment. In this sense, Paul is clearly not talking about something that happens in this world. In this context, he's saying to call on the name of Jesus publicly would have actually resulted in judgment and persecution. In the first few centuries of Christianity, this ragtag band of Christ followers were seen as radical revolutionaries, hell-bent on overturning the Roman Empire. This proclamation, Jesus is Lord, was actually a pun by the early Christians, meant to be offensive to Caesar and the empire. The empire was plastered with the words, Caesar is Lord, on coins and on buildings and on monuments. It was meant to create an imperial cult, an imperial cult, which resulted in devotion to Caesar. So when the early Christians said Jesus is Lord, they were being subversive. They were saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. Their salvation was about overturning the ways of this world and living in conformity with the way of Jesus. They were saying that no government could bring us salvation, but only the kingdom of God, following Jesus. See, remember when Paul writes in Romans 10, verse 9, he says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. In Paul's mind, being saved from destruction and judgment, the consequences of sin were being tied to being, were fundamentally tied to being devoted to the lordship of Jesus. Again, as you see in this context, salvation is intrinsically connected to this world, not some world after death. The declaration and dedication to following the leadership of Jesus had everything to do with life in this world. The early Christians believed that following the way of Jesus and the path of Jesus, this path of equity and nonviolence and self-sacrifice, and proclaiming grace for everyone, this would lead to a better world being created. The world that Caesar hoped to create through his oppressive force, but that Jesus taught could only come through service and love. 
See, the judgment that the early Christians were being saved from was the literal judgment that would come when Rome fell, the destruction of the empire and the forces that be. By creating subversive communities that cared for each other, apart from the empire, the earliest Christians were literally being saved from the coming judgment, the chaos that would ensue when the empire actually did fall, which they interpreted as the judgment of God. See, the early early church saw the destruction of oppressive systems and governments and empires as the act of God, revealing the sham that our human desire to control and manipulate in order to create prosperity flies directly in the face of God's desires for us. Are you with me? So in the first century Christian context, both words used to describe salvation actually refer to an experience or quality of life here and now. One word, soteria, literally means that when you follow in Jesus' path, you'll experience literal and spiritual prosperity and liberation. The other word, sozo, means that you'll literally be saved from God's judgment, from the corrupt systems of power, because you've invested in the kingdom of God and not in the kingdoms of this world. Interesting, right? But where does this talk about heaven and eternity come in? When Jesus speaks of salvation, he's most often not speaking about heaven or hell. For instance, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am telling you the truth. He who believes in me has eternal life. See, Jesus' understanding of salvation was tied to this thing called eternal life. The words eternal life in Greek is actually the words ionos, which literally means an extended or long period of time. The word means that if you follow Jesus, you will literally have a long and abundant life. In our theologized minds, we're conditioned to think of this as heaven, but every indication is that Jesus is saying when you follow in his path, your actual life now will be long and prosperous and blessed. The first and primary biblical understanding of salvation has to do with being saved from the judgment of of God against the structures and systems of this world and saved to have a prosperous life, both physically and spiritually. Now I know that the natural question is, what about heaven and hell? Surely there's part of salvation that is about the afterlife. And we're gonna talk about that momentarily, so stay with me. But the next question I think we need to answer is, who? Who is saved? See, throughout the history of Christianity, there's been a multiplicity of perspectives on the who of salvation. When salvation is put in the context of heaven or hell, the who of salvation becomes a vitally important question. Many within the Christian church over the centuries have believed that salvation is divided between two groups, those who are considered chosen and who have allegiance to Jesus and those who are considered reprobate, those who have allegiance to the world. The church began teaching this doctrine of damnation, which believed that those who didn't follow Jesus would go to hell, would be subject to God's judgment. Now it should be noted that all of our modern notions of hell, like the lake of fire and torment, are actually a product of the Renaissance period, largely developed by popular fiction writers like Dante in his book, Inferno. Similarly, ideas about heaven were largely developed and embellished from the medieval period in giant frescoes with cherubs and angels and clouds. And they come from the imagery used in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. In the scriptures themselves, there's actually very little talk about the afterlife, mainly because in Judaism, there was no concept of an afterlife. As shocking as that may be, it's true. Ancient mainstream Judaism didn't have a traditional understanding of an afterlife, and they didn't believe in a heaven or a hell. So when Jesus is speaking about the afterlife, he couldn't be speaking about these things because he had no such concept. Instead, Jesus, like many Jewish prophets, preached using metaphors. When Jesus talks about hell, he uses the word Gehenna, which was a literal real place that exists in Israel to this day. It was was the garbage dump where they would light flames to burn away trash. Jesus points to Gehenna and says, this is what judgment is like. But there's no indication 
that he believed in a literal place called hell. Even if we did believe in Gehenna being literal, it was always a place of refining, of cleaning. Because what was Gehenna? A place of waste, a place of cleaning up the trash. Many theologians have suggested that if Jesus had any conception of hell at all, the only potential belief was a hell in which we would be refined from our sins, being cleaned and pure. In other words, hell was a place of refining, not a place of judgment like Dante created. And that is also the same with heaven. Heaven in the Bible is a place on earth. The book of Revelation talks about heaven coming down out of the sky, coming to earth, even with the streets of gold and the clouds. The book of Revelation writes, behold, I saw the city of heaven coming down to earth. The idea that heaven would be a place on earth is the Christian idea of heaven. That a renewed world is what God is after and what God is calling us towards. Not some place in the sky after we die. So the next question that you probably have is, what happens then when we die? And the shocking answer I'm gonna give you this morning is, I don't know. That might sound chilling and disturbing, but I wanna be honest. The Bible gives us many personal insights into the afterlife, but it gives us no comprehensive answers. What I do know though, is that the scripture is abundantly clear, that God is love and that love casts out fear. So we have nothing to be afraid of. Secondly, the scripture tells us that we are eternal beings made in the image of an eternal God. So we have great reason to believe our life extends beyond death. And lastly, we're told that there is hope of a resurrection. But again, this isn't merely a spiritual resurrection, but a physical one, bodily, like we will physically have bodies like we do now. And those three points from the Bible give us great reason to be hopeful and at peace. But back to the question of who will be saved? To answer this question, I think there's two answers that come from the Bible. The first answer is not everyone will be saved in this life. But the salvation I'm talking about isn't salvation from hell, but ra rather the two literal words we discussed earlier, sozo and soteria. Jesus clearly teaches that there will be those who don't follow in his example. And when you don't walk on the path of Jesus, you will face consequences in this life. Jesus' path leads to abundant and wholeness in life. And when you're not living in that path of self-sacrificial love for the good of others, you will not experience the fullness of what God has for you now. In that sense, you will not be saved. I firmly believe that, that those of us who choose to walk in the ways of the world, in the ways of greed and privilege and oppression, that might, we might believe that brings us prosperity, but that will ultimately not fulfill us. And that will lead us to a sense of judgment, a sense of less than, a sense of not living in our fullness of life. And when the fragile artificial systems of this world crash down, those who are not walking in the way of Jesus, they will be affected by the rubble. So when Jesus calls us to flee from the wrath and the ways of this world and to come together to walk in the kingdom of God, it's a literal call to step out of the flow of this world and into the flow of the kingdom of God. So on one hand, not everyone will be saved. Those who resist the way of Jesus and live in the way of injustice will be recipients of judgment when the systems come crashing down. But on the other hand, the answer is everyone will ultimately be saved. Everyone will ultimately be embraced by the love and the grace of God. No one will be eternally damned or separated from God. My friend Rob Bell asked a few years ago a question that was provocative. He said, does God get what God wants? And his answer and mine is yes. If God has the a power to be God, if God is truly God, then God always gets what God desires. And the scriptures proclaim that God desires the entire world to be reconciled to himself. They say that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. 
They say that it's not the will of the Father that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And therefore, all will be saved. All will be reconciled to God. All will be redeemed. All will ultimately confess and align their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is really good news. If we believe that God's love never fails, that grace cannot be overspent, that God's will is powerful enough to get what God wants, then we cannot believe that anyone will be ultimately damned. To believe that would to believe precisely that God is not powerful enough to save. That love is not powerful enough to melt even the hardest of hearts. That not every human is truly a child of God. Because no parent would damn their child for eternity. And God is the greatest parent, the greatest source of love. And therefore, God will not damn a single soul. This, by the way, is not new theology. In fact, from the very earliest days of Christianity, there have always been mainstream theologians and teachers that have proclaimed the good news of God's ultimate salvation for all. Every indication is that some of the earliest theology of the church was a theology of universal salvation. But when Christianity got in bed with empire, we see the development of theologies of damnation and judgment because it's far easier to control people with fear than with love. When Christianity got in bed with empire, they turned Jesus into another Caesar, stripping him of this authentic message of all-inclusive love and making him a fierce, bloodthirsty judge. Did you know that the early church even believed that God's grace was so potent that they said this? The last to be saved will be the devil himself. That's St. Gregory of Nyssa, a saint lauded by all traditions of Christianity, who believed that God's love would ultimately win even the fiercest opponent of God. Because grace is that powerful. Love is that powerful. And that's the kind of salvation I truly desire, don't you? Which brings us to the final question. What is the end goal of salvation? What is the culmination of salvation? We've basically addressed this topic in everything that I've already said, but for the sake of clarity, let me summarize. The goal of salvation is for all of humanity and indeed all of the universe to be reconciled to God, which means that every single person would awaken to the truth that they are children of God, loved by God, and liberate it from the oppressive systems of this world that call us to conform and oppress and exploit others and ourselves. The goal of salvation is for the kingdom of this world to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The goal of salvation is for love and equity and justice to reign in all of our lives and in every corner of the world, creating the world that God always desired. This is what Jesus taught. This is what the New Testament outlines. And I believe this is what the Spirit of God is calling us towards every single day. The process of being saved in scripture is called sanctification, which literally means that all of us are progressively refined and reformed, progressive, tr progressively transformed, progressively awakened to the truth of who we are and the world as it can be. To be saved is to be set free, to live a prosperous and just life through service to God and to each other. To be saved is to refuse to seek the false and fleeting promises of the world that only come through power and privilege and oppression, and instead to seek to embrace the promises of God, of inclusion and embrace. To be saved is to escape judgment by aligning ourselves with the kingdom of God, which is eternal and true. This is what it means to be saved. This requires that we shift our perspectives. This requires that we adopt the way of Jesus to name him as our Lord and to commit to following his way. And the more that we do that, we're invited to invite others onto this path, into this abundant and prosperous life 
into this liberation. So when I say that y'all need to get saved, I really mean it. We all need to get saved from the deception of this world and conform our lives to Christ. And we have the promise that all of us ultimately will be saved by the love and the grace of God when all is said and done. And that is really good news indeed. Amen? Amen. Amen.